can't believe it's 29th of the 4th, 2018. Like, where's this year going? It's just disappearing, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, yeah, someone said, oh, you know, it's not far away from Christmas. And I was like, nah, nah, come on, but settle down. We've got to get through winter first, day. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, talked to a few people this morning and just kind of asked that question, did you survive the night? Did you get blown away? She was a little bit fierce. Um, our dog, he hates thunder, eh? So six o'clock this morning, I don't know if you're lightning and thunder, dogs were whimpering and crying. <laughs> so um, yeah, and then we had a baby as well, going. so it was great. It was a great mix this morning. It was perfect. But um, hey, this, this morning, I, I've entitled my message, Your Position Determines Your Dot, Dot, Dot. And um, Last week, if if you're with us last week, um, I threw out these three statements that I kind of just want to read again and just um, and reflect on here this morning. Um, And these three 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 statements were: your position determines your future, your position determines your effectiveness, and your position determines your fruit. And uh, I want to start this morning. I kind of just want to chew over these these three statements. I want to kind of just just get them you know, in, into our hearts, into our minds, into our mouths, as it were, and just chew over them and, and, and kind of just expand on them a wee bit this morning. So um, is, is that okay? You guys, you guys happy with that? Yeah, like I always say, you've got no choice anyway. Um, <laughs> your position determines your future. Uh, so, so that's my first one. Um, thanks. Thanks, dear Monica. So your position determines your future. And, and our context last week was uh, that famous chapter out of that book of Daniel, uh, Daniel and the Lion's Den, chapter six. Uh, we all know so well. And um, we're not going to reiterate what was there, but we just want to kind of chew over this, uh, this, this, this title, Your Position Determines Your Future. You see, Daniel, um, he placed himself uh, specifically in a certain position which determined his future, which determined his future. You know, uh, and, and as we looked at, at, at Daniel last week, he was exiled. He was a captive. He was a prisoner uh, to Babylon. Yet, yet he continued to position himself in God. And uh, that was kind of one of the keys that we were sort of looking at was, was how Daniel positioned himself. And, and um, you see, even, even though he was a captive, even though he was a prisoner, even though you know, his nation was, was in, in a good space, and then all of a sudden it fell into decline, and, and he became an, an, an exile, a captive, a prisoner, and then, um, then he was shipped off to Babylon, yet he had this huge drop in his life. He, he continued. He continued to place... Uh, the, the name of Jesus on high. He continued to position himself in Christ. And um, what happened was he's in this new foreign city with new foreign uh, or new kings, um, different religion. You, you can imagine this whole new shift going on within him, but he still chose to, to, to position himself in God. And, and, and through doing that, he, he rose in stature, and he rose in stature quickly. Um, he was placed in, into power, and he had this high profile. And and um, I guess right off the bat, the first thing I kind of want to spit out here this morning is, is we need to understand this completely, despite where we have come from, despite what our past is or has been, the, despite whether we've, we've, we, you know, we've been a, a prisoner, a captive, um, despite that, you know, just like Daniel, he, he positioned himself in God. And if we today position ourselves in God and, and every day, our future will be bright. Our future will be bright. And for Daniel in that moment, it didn't look like his future was going to be that bright, you know? When he was, he was a prisoner, he was captive, he was exiled, uh, things weren't looking good for him. But as he, as he placed himself in God's presence, as he continued to position himself there, he, he quickly rose to stature. Um, incredible. And his future was definitely bright. And, and our future also can be that way, you know, because our God will hold our future in his hands. But um, there was a sudden conflict, the season change, and Daniel was thrust from the, the palace through to the lion's den. Okay, so he'd already been through this big depression, and, and then he'd kind of come back up in this quick rise to position, and all of a sudden he was thrown back down. So you've kind of got this roller coaster going on, and, and we can totally relate with that in, in life, eh? We can totally relate. Um, you know, uh, emotions running high, situations, seasons, things that, that take place. Um, for us, it's a lack of sleep at the moment, and it, it kind of brings your true colors out, you know? Um, it's, 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 it's interesting. I love it, actually. It's cool because it's raw. It's real. Um, and, but, you know, this situation was raw. It was real for Daniel. He was suddenly thrust from the palace to the lion's den, you know, a physical position change that was out of his control. And some of you guys will relate with that. 
a physical position change that is out of your control, yet Daniel chose, or uh, Daniel's chosen position in God remained the same. Long story short, um, he was reinstated. He wasn't just reinstated, he was reinstated with this, this testimony, this great, incredible victory of how God miraculously saved his life. Um, and then, you know, we talked about that decree that, that um, Darius put out that, you know, all the, all the nations of the world will, 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 um, will worship the, the God of Daniel. And, and he kind of expanded, and we looked at that last week, and it was great. You see, as Daniel's position in God remained steadfast, his future and God's blessings went from strength to strength. You know, often we kind of look at that timeline of our lives of this up and down, and if we were going to put like a mean line through it, a trend line, we're sort of, you know, we're not quite at that peak, and we're not quite at that, that, that hollow, we're kind of in the middle there. But, you know, I honestly believe that, that we should be going from strength to strength. Our trend line, regardless of our situation, regardless of the roller coaster, our trend line should constantly be going from strength to strength, because that's the victory we have. I mean, do you guys read your Bibles? Is, is, is that what you guys see? Is that what you feel in your hearts? Is, is, is that the message that comes forth? You know, it is, isn't it? It is. From strength to strength. Don't get sucked down. Don't get sucked down. Continue to position yourself. Um, but if we choose to position ourselves away from God or outside of God, um, and what does that look like? It's, it's For us, I think, as Christians, it's sin without repentance. Our future will detrimentally um, be different to that of positioning ourselves in God. So there's this huge kind of choice, and, 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 and it is where we position ourselves determines our future. God has planned a future for us, and that's what I love. That's the other thing that we see when we read the Scriptures, that God, you know, before we were born, He knitted us together in, in our mother's womb, you know, like, I, 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 I've predestined you, I've called you. You know, there's all this talk in the Scriptures about how God has, has such this, this plan for us, but it's only there for us if we choose to position ourselves in Him. You see, that short-term future, that, that is awesome when we position ourselves in Christ as His provisions, it's His blessings here on earth. And our long-term future is heaven, is heaven with Him. Um, man, what an incredible hope. You see, your position determines your future, and, and that's that first point. Um, the second point, your position determines your effectiveness. And um, if you've got your Bibles, you don't necessarily need to jump there, but if you want to follow me um, and you've got quick fingers, then go for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We're going to jump on that one really quickly. I'll give you a second while I grab a drink. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were, were making His appeal through us. What, a, what an interesting verse. What an incredible verse this is. You see, this is actually, this is a commission. This is a commission. We've been assigned a task. Uh, we've been called to be Christ's official representatives. That's, um, that's, quite, a, that's quite a title, eh? That's quite a position. Um, I, I like that, that we're actually called to be Christ's official representatives. Um, you know, if if we want to be effective in our representation, if we want to be effective as ambassadors for Christ, we, we need to know a little bit about the person that we're representing. Is, is that not true? Because um, if we don't, um, we're going to do a pretty poor job of it. You know, like, for example, if I was the ambassador, um, if, if I was, let's, let's think of, um, if I was an ambassador for Malawi, okay, the country of Malawi to New Zealand, okay, I'd, be a, it'd be a, I'd do a terrible job at it because I have, Honestly, I don't know much about Malawi except it's a country in East Africa and they beat the Silver Ferns at the Commonwealth Games, you know? Like, <laughs> that's pretty much all I know about Malawi. So if I was an ambassador here in New Zealand, I'd, it'd be, I'd, be, I'd, I'd do a terrible job. So, silly example, but such a clear example. We need to position ourselves in Christ to be effective ambassadors. We need to position ourself, ourselves in Christ. You see, how do we do that? How do we position ourselves in Christ? Like practically, well, what are the things we need to do? And, um, and I'm not going to dive into this hugely because I, I think we can meditate and dwell on that and, and, and kind of get a revelation for ourselves. But it's, it's positioning ourselves in, in, the, in the Word, in the Bible, you know, getting ourselves into this book, you know, actually reading it, not just leave, letting it sit there and, and, and or maybe just flick into the odd verse here and there. Um, you need to read it up the right way. Um, but, you know, like actually get some, to get some chunks of scripture into us. You know, like it's such the popular thing. Oh yeah, verse of the day, get it on the phone, sweet as. Oh, that's a pretty cool one. I'll highlight that for later. 
But, you know, we need to get context. We need to get chunks of Scripture. We need to, we need to devour this thing. And, and that's what I'm talking about, positioning ourselves in, in the Word, in the Bible. That's going to make us uh, more effective in our, in our representation of Christ. Um, what, what's another thing? It's, it's being in His presence. It's absolutely being in His presence. Um, it's, it's being with His people. It's being with His people because iron sharpens iron, you know? If I was Malawi's ambassador, you know, the best thing for me would be that I've been brought up in Malawi, that I'm in, engrossed in the culture, that, that I'm mixing with the people, that I, that I understand the social uh, context and climate of that country, you know, that, that I actually know a, a lot about it. And, and it's exactly the same as, as what we need to be with Christ. We need to know the difference between what is truth and what is false doctrine? Because my goodness, there's a lot of false doctrine out there. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's out there to trip us up, to, to, to cause us to stumble and fall. And it's like, man, we just need to read it. It's here, you know? We need to, we need to hold our lives up to. We need to hold these arguments up to what, is, what does Scripture say? You know, that's, that's how we can be a true ambassador. Um, we need to know how God operates. How does God operate? Like, He operates in in the life of Daniel in a way that he shuts the mouth of the lion. Like, that is our God. That's how he operates. Like, does that not excite you? That our God is is a God that that nothing is impossible. That, man, he's got your back through any circumstance from high to low. Man, God is there in the midst. I love it. Love it. We, We need to know God's heart. We absolutely need to know God's heart. If we're a representative of him, we need to know his heart. And, um... You know, as, as, as we're kind of moving in this new season of this, this transition of, of church and, and this changeover of leadership and, and all of that kind of stuff, I, I want you guys to know that, that my heart and Jess's heart um, and our vision for this church is, is to establish effective ambassadors of Christ. That all of us, including myself, would, would continue to go from strength to strength, that, that we would be good, legitimate, real ambassadors of Christ. Um, so, so as we position ourselves... Um, hopefully into this church where the, where the Bible is preached, where, where His presence is, is here, where His people are here, and, and iron is sharpening iron. As we position ourselves here, as we, as we uh, position ourselves in God, that's how we're going to be effective for God's kingdom. Your position determines your effectiveness. Your position determines your effectiveness. All right, third, third point. Your position determines your fruit. Your position determines your fruit. And uh, again, quick fingers, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. We touched really briefly on on the context of this verse last week, and and I just kind of want to read it out in its entirety, these two verses here. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. You see, if we position ourselves in Christ, if, if we sow ourselves into Christ, if, if, uh, if, if we do that, we will reap the fruit from Christ. You know, that's what this verse is saying. That's what this verse is absolutely saying. But it also says if we position ourselves outside of God, if we sow ourselves into anything other than Christ, we will reap the fruit from outside of Christ. And uh, Matthew 12, 30, it says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You see, it's impossible to be neutral about Christ. It's absolutely impossible to be neutral about Christ. Either you're for me or you're against me. Either you're gathering or you're scattering. You know, it says it clear. This is, this is Jesus' words in Matthew, super clear. You see, if we're not positioning ourselves in Christ and we're positioning ourselves in something else, we are straight up against God. Like, it's black and white, you know? If we're not actively following Him, we're choosing to reject Him. And that's hard words, but that's Jesus' words. You know, he spoke these directly to the religious leaders of the day. Man, he was, he was hammering hard. He was going, he wasn't holding back. But it is so true, There's, it's impossible to be neutral about Christ. You see, God's fruit is eternal. God's fruit is eternal. All other fruit is not. 
God's fruit won't over-ripen. God's fruit won't spoil. And God's fruit will not go rotten. What happens if, if you've actually got a physical, you know, bag of fruit or, or a bag of fruit and, um, you know, it's a real legit fruit? What happens when it goes rotten? Um, has anyone kind of done the old left the lunch in the bag? I, I remember as a kid multiple times, um, you know, the, the lunch plastic bag, thrown in the bottom of the bag, and I've eaten all the good things out of it and I've left the fruit. And, um, and then, like, you know, a week goes by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by. I, I do, honestly, I can't remember the exact situation, but I do remember, like, picking up a bag and just being like, what is that? Oh, that's my mandarins and my banana, you know, like, this, this, what, what? You know, what happens when you have fruit that's rotten? It smells, eh? It smells, those fruit flies, you know? Like, honestly, I open the bag and they go in your mouth if you're not careful. Like, ah! um, it, it just turns gross, eh? It's just hideous. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. Go be a person who have these, who have these things going on in your life. You know? Smelly. Fruit flies hanging around you. You know? Just turning into a mess because that's just gross. You can't be a good ambassador for Christ for Christ, when, when you've got fruit flies hanging around you, you know, it's rotten fruit, rotten fruit. God's fruit is eternal. All other fruit is not. All other fruit is not. If we position ourselves in Christ, we will, root, we will reap fruit from Christ. If we position ourselves in Christ, we will reap fruit from Christ. Your position determines your fruit. Your position absolutely determines your fruit. You see, these three statements, um, I believe, are true. And, and um, I mean, I've been harping on for the last 15 minutes about it. And um, I, I so believe that they are true. But if, if they really are true, then isn't it so important that we actually need to position ourselves in the right place? If these, if these statements are true, then, then what are we doing about it? What are, what are we doing about it? So I, I just want to change tack here for a second. Um, you know, it's, 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 I guess if you're picturing it like a, a plane taking off, and, and flying towards its destination. Sometimes they just tack away so they can get a better vantage point to swing around, line up the, the landing strip and, and drop into descent. So we're getting there, okay? We're just tacking around. We're, we're arcing around. Don't worry, we'll, we'll land on time. The flight hasn't been delayed. Um, we'll get there. Lunch is still going to be there. But um, So I just, just want to tack away f- for a second. I want us to think about um, early, early settlements or, or an early settlement or a pass site or an ancient city. And think about where they are positioned. Not sure if you've ever thought about this before, but, but none of these, you know, uh, an early settlement, a pass site, an ancient city, they didn't just kind of like roll out their scroll map or whatever it was, whatever they had, their GPS um, map, and go, ah, there, let's do it right there. You know, what this, it was never randomly just positioned wherever the heck they kind of felt like it was the best place to be. You know, what did they actually do? They took time to survey and scout the land, checking all the surrounding features and areas. That's what would happen back in the early days. You know, why would they do that? Interesting, why would they do that? But there's, there's three major factors that those early pioneers took into account when they were surveying, when they were scoping the land out in order to find the best position to settle and to build. I mean, that was the goal, was to find the, the absolute best position to be in. So, so what are these three major factors? What are these three major factors? I heard the first one right down here, water. Water is an absolute, um, it's an obvious one. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute obvious one. The, the second one is resources, is resources. And the third one might not be what you guys think, but it's mountains, mountains. So there's water, there's resources, and there's mountains. You see, water, like I said, it's that obvious one. Um, it's, it's a major factor in survival, isn't it? We need to have water, fresh water, springs, creeks, rivers, that kind of thing. But you know what, what else is amazing about water? Is, is it's salty sometimes, isn't it? So sea is important. Sea, inlets, and harbors. You see, rivers and sea are still the most effective way of transporting and trading goods even today. In fact, 14 of the 15 largest cities in the world today are, are, are built within a handful of kilometers to, to the coast or, or to a major body of water. So it tells us that absolutely back in the day, water was important, and absolutely today, water is important. Um, for all of you like tech people that love kind of like, you know, the, 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 the change of society and, and the digital age that we're going into, 
um, it's interesting to know that cities actually now can survive away from the water, you know. Um, there's, you know, the technology has changed. There's been such a shift, and, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, give it 50, 60, 100 years, 20 um, 20 times that, whatever, you know, like how, how, how will those cities, will, will they continue to be sustainable or, or will it kind of fall back to this kind of needing to be near uh, the water? Anyway, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked. So water is, is an absolute major one. Resources, resources are huge. There, there can be a, a, a massive amount of different resources that, that can kind of uh, draw uh, these, these surveyors or these scouts, these pioneers in. Um, for example, trees for building, clay for building, um, what about fertile soil for growing, um, herbs for medicines, minerals for trade, for, for, for wealth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different resources that, that are important um, or that could, could draw, draw you in to, to help you survey the best place. Um, so that's really interesting. And, and the third one, mountains. You know, often where there are mountains, generally there is water. Generally there is resources and generally there is minerals. Uh, which is which is quite cool, which is quite fascinating. And these 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 old school pioneers, they knew that they knew what they were looking for. They had their you know they had their fluoro uh, little notebook out, and they had their little checkbooks and uh, their, their checklist. Sorry, water. Yep, resources. Yep. Okay, where are the mountains? And yep, you know. But the other thing that mountains provided was a vantage point, and was protection. And this is where it gets interesting. This is this is where I'm going with this tangent. It's it's vantage points and protection. You see, um, vantage points, protection, are extremely important. And back in the day, even so much uh, so, you know, they were, they were so important because the enemy would come. That's, that's why the enemy would come. You know, you can have all the resources in the world, but if you physically can't protect those resources, then there's kind of no point really having them, you know? Um, so so what, what did vantage points and mountains do? It was kind of like, it was, it was like a wall around a city or it was like a, uh, uh, um, kind of like a, a backstop, you know, where the enemy couldn't necessarily come in and attack you from behind, a vantage point on top of a hill, you know, it was, it was a way to, to look out and see if the enemy is coming to, to get the army ready, to, to get the warriors ready, as, as, as it were, and, and, and to prepare to, to defend your resources and your assets. So you see vantage points and, and, and protection, hugely, hugely important. Uh, these early pointers, uh, pioneers, sorry, these early pioneers always had defense in mind when they were surveying, scouting the land because their livelihood depended on it. Their livelihood absolutely depended on it. Their families, their kids, their, their, their food, all of that kind of stuff. It was, it was um, so important that defense was, was so in their mind. You know, times are different now. We don't necessarily build with this mindset of, of defending against the enemy, do we? You know, we kind of just get our council permit, sweet as, build a house, she'll be right. We're really only worried about north facing, aren't we? Or where's that sun or, you know, climate change. Oh, we don't want to be on the beachfront. We need to be up on the hill. You know, I mean, these, these are the things that, that kind of go into our minds as we build. And, um, but, you know, times are different. Times are different. Society has changed. It's, it's not so much a, a battle to survive because we don't have, you know, like, um, Turoa or, or, or Natia, like just coming up the, the why how to, to attack us and um, to try and steal our, our wives and children and, and our harvests and our crops. Um, don't get any ideas, Nige, don't get any ideas. Put those guns away. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's different. Society's changed. It's, it's not this battle to survive, but it's, it's more this battle to thrive, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Like, kind of, you know, this, this um, first world country we live in, it's, it's, it's not survival, it's, it's thrival. Is that even a word? I don't know. But um, that's, that's what it's like. It's keeping up with the Joneses. What's interesting, though, is, is the battle, the conflict, the hostility between good and evil, between heaven and hell, between God and Satan has never changed. It's never changed. And I wonder if because of our modern society with less focus on defense in the natural or the physical world, that, that maybe also there's, there's less of a focus on defense in our spiritual world, in our spiritual life. You see, the battle hasn't changed. The enemy hasn't changed. The, the devil still prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's scripture. That's the ruthless nature of the enemy that we're up against, looking for someone to devour. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Our spiritual defense, defensive game is in decline. I honestly believe in this. In our first world countries, our spiritual defensive game is in decline. They say defense 
wins competitions or wins matches. And they also say poor or bad defense loses matches. And a clear example on Wednesday night is the Warriors took the field um, against the Storm. We won't talk about that, but bad defense can lose a competition. See, as Christians, our defensive game needs to be on point. It absolutely needs to be on point. And what's the best way to, to, to defend as Christians? What's the best way that we can defend? The best way to defend against the en- enemy that we face is to position ourselves in Christ. Is to position ourselves on Christ, on the rock, build our lives, build our house, build on the rock, on Christ, positioning ourselves in Him and on Him. You see, the pioneers of old, they surveyed and they they scoped out the land and the sea. They did their homework. They strategically placed um, or or picked the, the best place to settle and to build. You know, a place that was rich in resources, a place that, that, uh, that had a position that, that, that had that defensive edge. And my challenge today to us is let's be like those old school pioneers and let's build in a place that is rich in resources. And by that, I mean a place where, where God's word is preached and not twisted, where the Holy Spirit dwells and there's freedom for him to move. Let's, 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 let's do that in a place where God's people can, can share genuine community, where iron sharpens iron, like I talked about before. And of course, a place that is surrounded by protection. And that place, that position is on Christ, our rock. So finally, I want to sum this up. Your position determines your future. Your position determines your effectiveness. Your position determines your fruit. And finally, your position determines your victory. Your position determines your victory. Let's just, um, let's just pray, eh? We've, we've just landed. We've just landed. We've just come on in.